thanks again for coming by uh, to my talk here. Um, I am Colleen and I teach here at the New School. I've been here 23 years. I think I'm almost at my 100th class taught here. I don't know why they keep letting me do that. Um, but uh, I run a research lab here at Pet Lab, I mean at Parsons, uh, the new school called Pet Lab. This is my 10th Games for Change, and it's the 10th year of Pet Lab. So uh, all of this stuff kind of happened at once for me, which is um, exciting. How many of you is this your 10th Games for Change? Whoa, yes! You win. Um, uh, you know, and at Pet Lab, we do a lot of different things. Uh, we made uh, a game about activism that has you running around the city recreating uh, famous past moments of activism. This is the Stonewall set of challenges. Um, uh, you know, we do uh, involve uh, uh, young children um, perishing on the streets. Um, not really. I'm trying to see how awake you guys are this morning. <laughs> Come on. Um, uh, and uh, it's been played in a bunch of different cities at this point, Atlanta, Philadelphia, here in New York. Um, we also make uh, uh, games uh, that are more sporty. This is Budget Ball. Uh, it was a game that was played on the National Mall uh, every year in Washington, D.C. until recently. Uh, uh, but it is a physical and fiscal sport about the federal deficit and how, uh, surprise, all the young college students today get to inherit uh, that wonderful multi-trillion dollar deficit that we're in. Um, uh, this young woman is holding the egg, uh, which is a particular challenge in the, in the sport. But it's a lot like uh, Extreme Frisbee or something like that. Ultimate Frisbee. Ultimate Extreme Frisbee. Extreme Ultimate Frisbee. Um, this is uh, me in Uganda. Uh, we uh, have worked for about seven years with the Red Cross making games for disaster preparedness. And they're also physical games. So a lot of my work is not video games, but, but a lot of physical games. This is a card game about the human microbiome. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only card game about the human microbiome. Has any of you made it? Okay. Maybe there's another one out there, I don't know. Um, and then I make entertainment games on the side with uh, my collabor collaborators, John Sharp, and yeah. I don't know, what do you think has more empty calories? This PowerPoint presentation, maybe that's it. Um, uh, this is with John Sharp and Eric Zimmerman, we're local number 12, and so we do games on the side, outside of uh, our academic work. We're all game academics, and John actually co-directs Pet Lab with me. We're currently working on a game for librarians. Not really, but yeah. <laughs> They're an untapped demographic, uh, we think, uh, in the free-to-play market. Um, but this is an iPhone game about uh, classic literature. Um, and John and I, because we kind of are attached at the hip, we're like uh, work spouses. Um, we, a year ago, at Games for Change, released our first book, Games, Design, and Play. We wanted to call it the uh, game, game design for social justice warriors, um, but uh, a publisher wanted to make sure that we didn't. I don't know why. <laughs> I thought it would work well. Um, and uh, we're currently working on a project called Iterate, um, Perspectives on Design of Failure. And we've interviewed a bunch of different people who may not even consider themselves designers, like a pro skateboarder, Amelia Brodka, um, and uh, Wiley Dufresne, the chef. Uh, about failure and how do they deal with it. And that'll be a book coming out uh, in about a year and a half through MIT Press if we ever finish writing it. Here I teach a course uh, that has a, about 100 students enrolled in it. It's a big lecture uh, called Gaming the System, the Political Potential of Play. And because I was lazy, I called this talk the same. Um, but this is new material, not necessarily from the class. But I, what I will say about that uh, course is that it gets undergraduate students from across the whole school. They might be studying liberal arts, journalism, jazz, uh, fashion design, to make games for change. And so we, have about, we had about 40 games for change uh, that we made over the course of the semester. And we really try to understand how political systems can be modeled using game systems um, but we also try to understand fun and play and all of those kinds of things. And the, and the political 
kind of transgressive aspects of play. But what only my good friends know about me is that I am a chipoholic. <laughs> uh, anything crunchy uh, with preferably some kind of powder, uh, savory powder all over it, uh, I am all over that. Um, I always uh, have chips uh, kind of around. Um, it is, uh, I'll be writing a, a book on the, the chip diet. Uh, chips and coffee, that's about it. Um, and, you know, for a while there, uh, I was vegan. And, uh, uh, you know, not all these chips are vegan. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, <laughs> some of them have, like, um, uh, ground chicken in them. Um, and you wouldn't even think of it because it's like nacho cheese. But, well, oh, yeah, of course that has ground chicken in it. Um, and uh, so... Uh, I found this website uh, through my friend John, who is also vegan, um, that uh, is uh, called Accidentally Vegan. Um, these are chips and crunchy snacks that are really bad for you, but they just so happen to be, by accident, <laughs> vegan. They involve no forced impregnation of animals, they involve no animal squeezing, they involve no animal meat harvesting. Um, they are just accidentally vegan. Whoops, oh, just how it happens that we didn't torture animals for this. Um, and um, so that was great when I discovered that. Uh, and I actually discovered, so this is vegan here on the left, the way most people think of it, right? This sort of bland, <laughs> tasteless cube. Um, and then over here on the right is, is accidentally vegan Doritos. Taste the flavor explosion, um, and um, these are really good, a good uh, kind. This is the only accidentally vegan Doritos, um, uh, sweet, uh, spicy sweet chili. It's also, the, I think, the most delicious Dorito. I know there's some Cool Ranch, I know there's Cool Ranch people out there, but I'm sorry, the sweet and spicy, let's hear it. Um, I am the only Games for Change developer who's actually got a sponsorship from Doritos. And um, so today, Today, I bring to you. Well, that was exciting. See, are you awake now? <laughs> Nothing like sweet and spicy Doritos for breakfast, I gotta tell you. Um, so, so, yeah, I was thinking, you know, there's games for change. Kind of like tofu, you know, they're really good for you. They involve no harm to animals, we hope. Um, they're not so delicious all the time. Um, but then there's this thing that I'm going to call accidentally games for change. And that's what we're going to look at today. Um, they are delicious. Um, they're loved by many. I'm sorry, games for change are... We can say that we have hundreds and thousands of downloads, but still, in the scheme of things, you know, that's, uh, that's how many people are eating tofu. Um, you know, one involves a little prep. I mean, the, the tofu, honestly, you're not going to really want to eat like that, um, although I have. Um, and then the other one, you just open the bag, and it, it's right there, right? So uh, games for change sometimes need a little context. They need a little, like, uh, uh, teacher intervention before and after, um, whereas Doritos, what else do you need? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> On the left... Uh, Sorry, not everyone likes to tofu. Um, but on the right, everyone loves Doritos. Like, I don't know anyone who doesn't love Doritos. Um, if you don't, you should leave right now. <laughs> but what I was thinking about when I thought about this, is actually 10 years ago at Games for Change, there was one thing said that really struck me, and it's stuck with me ever since. Um, someone stood up and they raised their hand, they asked, uh, it was a, a panel of designers, um, and there were a bunch of different, I think Eric Zimmerman, Frank Lance, 
Tracy Fullerton might have been there. There were a bunch of like amazing uh, game designers uh, on the panel, and um, it was like ask a designer, you know, what, you know, how to make games for change and stuff like that. And um, someone stood up and said, "How do we make a game to keep kids in school?" And the answer, I think it was Frank who said this. Frank Lance, who is at NYU right now, said. Uh, instead of like, oh, let's make a role-playing game that kids can play and they can see the results of what happens if they drop out of school uh, or if they stay in school. No, 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 that wasn't the answer from the game designers here. They weren't saying like, oh, try this genre of games and you know, craft it this way, no. They said, mm, what about football? That's a game that keeps some kids in school, probably some of the ones that are most likely to drop out. Hey, maybe chess club. My friend Maurice Ashley uh, teaches chess in Williamsburg and in a bunch of other places, and these kids are amazing. Like, they're staying in school because Maurice, who is a chess grandmaster, the first African-American chess grandmaster, is there teaching them chess. So that's the accidental game for change, right? You name it, field hockey, competitive cheerleading, um, whatever sport, whatever game it might be, that might be the accidental games for change that's actually keeping kids in school. When we talk about impact and we talk about distribution, let's look at what's already having impact and what's already out there. So today, we're gonna talk about some uh, accidental games for change. I've selected three here. Uh, they form the triad. <laughs> I am gonna beat this metaphor <laughs> until there's only, you're all covered in Dorito dust. Um, and that is, only appropriate because that would make you a proper gamer to be covered in Dorito dust. The first is tennis. The second is Cards Against Humanity. And the third is a little game called Stardew Valley, but I'm gonna digress a little bit with there. But how many Stardew players are, are there? Whoa, yes! I've got questions for you later about cheese making. I know, it's not vegan, but it, in the game it is. Just pixels. Okay, so I'm gonna start with tennis and I'm starting with this match. This is the battle of the sexes. Was anyone alive during this match? Yeah, me too. I mean, I was a little kid, but, but this, was, um, this was a big deal. Um, there was like an ABC TV series called Battle of the Sexes afterwards, which was kind of ridiculous and fun. Um, and I think they're bringing it back. But this is the original 1973 Battle of the Sexes, soon to be made into a major motion picture. Uh, with Steve Carell and uh, some other folks. Um, I'm now forgetting the other, the, the, the main lead, who's Billie Jean King. Does anyone, Emma Stone, yes. Um, so this is um, the Battle of the Sexes, if you haven't heard of it. This was like an incredibly hyped, televised tennis match with a purse of $100,000 which in 1973 was equivalent to about $1.5 million now. I don't know, something like that. Um, and um, it, it was majorly hyped. So Bobby Riggs is a tennis champion. Um, he was past his prime at the time that he actually was the one who instigated this. He challenged uh, uh, the amazing tennis player, Billie Jean King, to a match and said, I can beat any woman at tennis. I can beat Billie Jean King at tennis. Um, because women should stay in the kitchen, it's not their place to be on the tennis court, and all of this kind of stuff, and he was, the, he was a proclaimed male chauvinist pig, and uh, all of these kinds of things, he was really ridiculous. Uh, and he challenged uh, Billie Jean King. I'm gonna leave you in suspense here for a minute, uh, we'll, we'll talk about who won in a, in a second here. Uh, I'm gonna digress to a childhood memory. Um, this is my tennis racket uh, from when I was about 12, um, this is Billie Jean King on this tennis racket. Um, slightly later, you can see she got that, that perm, um, which we all had then. That was a, that was a good move, fashion-wise. Um, and the slight aside is just that I grew up playing tennis with this racket, and I, every single day, would go down to the school and hit the tennis ball against the wall, like constantly, constantly, constantly. That's all I did. I was an only child. I had no other uh, uh, way of uh, having fun. I guess I, I played video games, but, but this was my one physical uh, activity. And um, 
Some older kids came by, and they saw my tennis racket, and they were like, ah, ha, ha, ha. Billie Jean King is so gay, right? She, at that point, she had come out and, and all of that stuff, so um, I immediately uh, defaced my tennis racket with an IZOD sticker because I was ashamed and repulsed that I could possibly... They said, your tennis racket's gay, and that makes you gay, too. So I, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, I hid it, and now I'm out and proud. Yes. So... <laughs> I did take, I did take the, uh, I took the sticker off, carefully. <laughs> we don't need to cover up Billie Jean King on our tennis records, come on people. But yeah, th that's, that's what that time was like, I'll, just to give you a, a sense of things. Um, anyway, so this is some footage from the Associated Press. It doesn't have sound, but this is amazing. I mean, this was such a television spectacle. It was actually the number wa one watched televised sporting event at that time. And there's Billie Jean King coming in. I think Helen Reddy's I Am Woman is being played. This is, okay, the, the pig that uh, Bobby Riggs uh, carried uh, being a chauvinist pig and all these kinds of things, or cheerleaders. Um, he wore this weird sugar daddy's jacket, um, which I would die to have. It looks pretty cool. Um, so this might seem like a nostalgic tale. Uh, on the right, you'll see the results of the match. Billie Jean King won. Yeah, easily, actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, she, I mean, she's got this really aggressive style you can kind of see here. She's really, like, she, she loves to, like, serve hard and go up to the net and volley really hard, um, uh, whereas Bobby Riggs is more of a mind games player, really, ultimately. Um, but I want to preface this, this game with a few months earlier in June. So this is September, in June, in a hotel room at the Wimbledon tournament. tournament. Billie Jean King invited some other female players um, to meet up late at night in a hotel room. This was like um, kind of under the cloak of night. And they founded the Women's Tennis Association, uh, which is a, was totally grassroots. These women all agreed to sign on to this tennis association in the effort to get equal pay, right? And to have equal purses at these uh, tournaments, because it was unequal, right? Like male players would get 10 times what female players would. And so a few weeks before this event, um, the US Open, I, I, they basically said, we're not gonna play if we're not paid equally, which is pretty cool. Um, and the US Open actually, uh, right before this event, like I would say like a week before this event, uh, gave equal purses to male and female players. So what does this game have to do with that? I mean, obviously, there was a win before that. I will note that Wimbledon took until 2007 to offer equal purse, uh, equal money prizes to male and female players. So that's kind of ridiculous. Um, but what I think is interesting about this is that it took this game to bring these issues to the public consciousness and um, took this kind of uh, dramatic spectacle for that. It also was the decisive battle in a much longer war, right, if you consider it that way, that actually ended up uh, getting CBS a few months later to sign a broadcasting contract with the Women's Tennis Association to broadcast women's tennis for the first time. Okay, so prior to this, we didn't have women's tennis televised on a major network. Um, you know, it just was not equal whatsoever. As we all know, it's way more fun to watch Venus and Serena play than any of those guys, so. <laughs> Sorry, they are much more fashionably exciting and their tennis game rocks. Um, so to understand how this works, I'm going to start um, with this model um, that uh, I'm going to describe. So we have this thing called the game, right? Uh, and the game in this case is, is, is Battle of the Sexes. Um, and this model is, is uh, based on something that uh, my colleague John Sharp uh, developed. Uh, the, 
the model has these things called ripples of play. So games don't exist in a vacuum, right? They're not just this, right? They've got to have a player, right? And so this first ripple of play is play and fun. It's at the player level. It's the kind of thing that emerges from this, this game, which uh, the game becomes like an engine for play and for fun. The second, or yep, second ripple are play styles. This is player to player. So, you know, um, in the Battle of the Sexes, you got to see Bobby Riggs' like weird psych out game uh, paired with Billie Jean King's aggressive net based volley game. In fact, Bobby Riggs faked an injury halfway through the match <laughs> to get Billie Jean King's sympathy and have her like hold back a little bit on her, her incredible aggressive game, but she didn't. <laughs> the third ripple is where you have communities of play. So this would be the, at the women's tennis association level, right? Where you have people who play the game together, they form a community. Uh, they experience the same experiences together. And here on the lower left, if you take a picture of the screen, you'll see John's uh, essay about the ripples of play, which will explain these ripples even better than I can. Ripple four is games as culture. <clears throat> this is communities of play with spectators. So, so at this point, the game moves beyond the people who even play it to the people who watch or the people who are um, affected by the game in some way as a form of culture. And beyond this is uh, where c culture reflects back, right? In the case of Battle of the Sexes, uh, finally, because of that one battle in a longer war, culture reflected back and CBS said, look, we're going to televise women's tennis now. I would say an accidental games for change like the Battle of the Sexes operates on these outer three layers. It becomes a game for change at this point. And in particular, because the game itself, tennis has you know, very little to do with uh, politics, although most games do have some politics to them. I will, I will say that. Um, but in this case, the political meaning and the political change came about on these outer layers. And in particular, the spectation of this event, the, the fact that it was the most highest rated televised sporting event at the time changed things. So in thinking about a, making a game for change, how are you thinking potentially about spectation, about people who watch the game and may not play it? So much of, I mean, Twitch culture and other kinds of things are about how much fun it is to watch that game. And I think Constance men mentioned yesterday, um, as well as the, the amazing neurologist who ran around the stage was incredible, um, that we have mirror neurons and that actually watching the game has the same learning benefits as playing the game. So thinking about how people get to watch the game you've made is as important as the people who play it. Um, that's kind of the strategy that we use with uh, uh, the game, we, you know, uh, Budget Ball. It's like less people play that game than see it, uh, either on TV or in other formats on, online on YouTube. Um, and it's really the spectation. It's like we designed that game to look good for people who watched it because that's where the message happened. All right, so let's move on to Cards Against Humanity. Uh, if you don't know what it is, um, so I've actually, actually, here, let's go back. I've deliberately chosen a sport, a tabletop game, and a video game because I want to really look at broader games that become accidental games for change. Um, so Cards Against Humanity builds itself as a party game for horrible people. Um, and if you haven't played, how many of you have played this game? Okay, pretty much everybody, right? Um, you know, it is the trivial, trivial pursuit of our age. You know, Trivial Pursuit was cool in the 80s, and now we've got Cards Against Humanity. Um, it's been the top-selling tabletop game for seven years running on Amazon. This game is a blockbuster, obviously. Um, and it's kind of, if you haven't played it, you have these black cards, like I, have, I wish I hadn't lost the instruction manual for, um, and it could be, uh, I don't even want to read the uh, answers. <laughs> <laughs> you can fill them in with the white cards, obviously. Um, 
But, what's in, but the thing about Cards Against Humanity, I think the reason it's so successful is because, is because it's kind of like a steam release valve for a generation who's grown up having to be politically correct in politically correct culture, right? So it lets you be really transgressive and naughty and be horrible, but well, we know we're not really horrible, wink, wink. Um, but the, where I think Cards Against Humanity becomes an accidental games for change is all the other stuff they end up doing with their money. Um, so uh, one of the things, that we, you know, the makers have defined their own politics by doing all these extracurricular projects with Cards Against Humanity, whether they're expansion packs like this Trump pack. Um, they sold a Clinton and Trump expansion pack, and the profits from both went to the Clinton campaign. Uh, <laughs> They did the science pack, which raised scholarship uh, money for women studying science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, they recently sold out of the Cards Against Humanity for Her, uh, which just so happens to be the same exact thing, but it's pink. Uh, <laughs> and it's $5 more, and the proceeds went to Emily's List. Um, they did an advertisement at this year's Super Bowl that was basically a potato with the word advertisement on it. Um, uh, they paid for this political billboard, which appealed to gamers, specifically Overwatch players. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. Um, and uh, in one of the more nihilistic brand stunts they ever performed, they uh, spent over $100,000 that was raised, crowdfunded by people, to just dig a big hole. <laughs> As Temkin, one of the creators of the game, says, we just do it because it's funny. Um, so Cards Against Humanity also operates sort of on these outer cultural layers. I would say that actually a lot of what, where their strength is, is in this outer layer where culture reflects back. But the game itself was born out of that, was born out of being an escape valve for where uh, we are with contemporary culture. I would actually venture to say that playing the game now doesn't feel as good in this era as it did perhaps before. Um, and that that transgression, that punk rock, wink, wink, just for the lols kind of attitude, um, it, it, because it's been adopted by uh, political factions on the right, even better than on the left, um, among my friends, we, we kind of don't want to play it anymore. It just doesn't feel right. Um, but the stuff they do outside of it, I think, is even more interesting. Um, you know, the things they do outside of the game, even digging a big whole, because that's how we all felt uh, after the election. The final game in this list is Stardew Valley. Um, Stardew Valley uh, is a game designed by one person, Eric Barone. It took him uh, four years to make, um, which I think is pretty impressive. It's an incredibly deep game. Um, it's kind of like Farmville with a lot more cool stuff, with a community, um, with a village. Uh, a big evil corporation threatening the community, a bunch of different things in it. It is um, decidedly an entertainment game. So this game is, uh, uh, when it came out, it, it broke records on Steam. People love this game. Uh, if you ever watch the Twitch streams, they're really endearing and fun. Uh, because this game, you know, is very different. It's just you're farming. You've got a farm. This is me. Um, uh, this is my farm. It's very underdeveloped right now. I need to work harder. Uh, that's why I have to ask you guys about some of this stuff. Um, but um, it's kind of boring, but in a pleasing kind of way. It's actually, I would say, uh, one of a new set of games called Earnest Games. I would say these are games in their earnestness, really are just about uh, loving games. This is a, an homage to Harvest Moon and some other games that predate it. Um, and what's interesting to me is, though, the fact that it's an indie game. Um, but it ex really explores the connection that the designer has with the community of players. You can actually message Eric Barone, the maker of this game, and he will write you back right away. I don't know if this person has a computer in their brain and they just like psychically transmit messages, but they're incredibly responsive to their community. Um, what's interesting to me is that when uh, there was an open beta of this game, the players were, were begging for... Um, you're gonna see me like walk around and get lost a lot and have to look at the map constantly because I still, <laughs> still can't figure it out. But um, uh, players were begging for the opportunity to be able to harvest meat from the animals in the game. 
if you played the game, you know that's kind of weird because you pet the animals and they have little love signs over their head and, and, and all of those things. And uh, Barone put it into the game for a little while but realized this is just harshing the mellow of this game. It just ruins the vibe. So he took it out. Um, and I think that um, what's interesting to me here as an accidental game for change is not that it's saying we should all be vegetarians. He's, he's a vegetarian, but we don't all have to be them. Um, but rather that the possibility space of the game is constrained through his own design values which fit his political values and perspectives. Um, Shane is never gonna like me in this game. Anyway, um, I could have, I almost went to, as far as, to, to, I, I was like, let's do Minecraft because everybody's talking about Minecraft, it's a really hot thing, the education version, all of this stuff, but I am sorry, I think that Minecraft is a piece of Anne Randian libertarian propaganda. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this game. Uh, it's politics, at least. I mean, it might be fun to play. Um, yeah, sure, let's exploit the land and, uh, you know, steal stuff from the villagers who are like sheep and be the master builder of our own castles. Um, that's survival mode and, and, and uh, you know, I don't want to go into the politics of uh, creepers and what they obviously represent and other things. Um, but it really is a libertarian Lego playtime and I think it's problematic. Um, but if it sounds like I'm being stodgy here, I will just say that the community of players do things like this. They make computers in the game that block the creator's Twitter account. <laughs> um, so the relationship between players and the, and the creator isn't, isn't that great. Um, and please don't ever look at that Twitter account. It will make you real mad. Um, of course, the education edition, it is an accidental games for change because people are, Microsoft bought it, they've turned it into an educational tool, there's a lot of benefits to it. So I, I don't want to trash it too, too much, but it is a piece of libertarian propaganda. <laughs> um, but over here, you know, the kind of comments you see on the Steam thing, I wish farms were real. <laughs> so sweet. Oh. I love Stardew Valley players. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, that game I think operates at this ripple. Uh, the communities of play, they create the meaning, they come together, watch a Twitch stream with Stardew Valley, it's amazing, it's like the most chilled out, fun thing. One woman has a bird cam, she's got a bird feeder that she switches to every once in a while out in, in the real world in her house, and it's just like, oh yeah, I could watch this all day long. Um, what I think is interesting as a lesson here is the relationship with your community, but also the idea of a developer and of the indie uh, scene, perhaps coming over and connecting up um, with the Games for Change scene. Uh, we have Stephanie Barish who, here, who is one of the founders of IndieCade, and that's a wonderful conference, very scrappy like this one. Um, uh, and I think there are good examples here, like Mole Industria's uh, insightful political games, uh, games for protest is the best, I love those games. Um, uh, you know, Nikki Case's explorations of systems, um, uh, even much of Anna Anthropy's work, although I don't think she would consider herself a games for change maker. Um, so in that case, I think what's interesting is to question um, how independent can you be? How connected to your community can you be? And how do we get some of the funding for Games for Change over to the indie community and vice versa. I'll leave that up to all of us to figure out. Anyway, that, I'm closing uh, now, I'm stopping. I see I'm a little over time. Um, but Games for Change, accidentally Games for Change, um, those are some that I think are interesting and can provide some insights when you look at that model of the ripples of play that my colleague John uh, invented. We begin to see how outside, you could kind of come from the outside in, right? and look at how to make Doritos and tofu. Wait, I've got an idea. Um, oh, there are a few other possibilities I had here. I was gonna look at a bunch of other things. We won't go there. Um, okay, those outer layers. Um, this is a recipe. <laughs> I, th I think we can move away from chocolate covered broccoli uh, and uh, know by now that games can be fun and good for you. It's okay, they're not gonna taste like chocolate covered broccoli. They're gonna maybe be a little bit more like these delicious and popular accidentally vegan do Dorito encrusted tofu cutlets. Um, 
And uh, this is good. I've made it. Uh, it's from Bake and Destroy, which is a great website. And um, I would propose that we begin to think about what is that outer crust, that outer layer of community, culture, and culture reflecting back uh, spectators, others who aren't even playing our games, and how do we leverage that? So thank you.